So we can do the refuge prayer. I forgot this morning. We can do the refuge prayer and the seven limbs and the mandala. Those three. Remembering, thinking what we're doing, you know. Not just all singing a prayer. We're um, stating thoughts, basically. Hopefully to a nice tune, you know. Makes it moves the mind a bit. It's in Tibetan, but we see the English meaning. So they'll be the thoughts we put into our mind. So the first one, this refuge, is two parts. The first part is for those of us who figure we're Buddhist, and we're reiterating our reliance on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha. Every time you state it, like anything, it's like doing a push-up, you get better at it. We don't think that with thoughts. We don't think, we don't know about training thoughts in our world, even though we do it every day, when we learn music and things, but we don't think of it like this. So when we think it's spiritual, we think it's something completely different. And it's not exactly the same. I cannot tell you this enough. It is exactly the same process. You're changing your thoughts. So if you, and just like when you start learning music thoughts, your behavior changes. You do amazing things with your hand up and down the piano, don't you? Look at you. It's broad. Same here. You change your thoughts, your hands and body will be different. You'll say kind words and say, and do good things. It's not, it's not different. It is not different from what we mean by learning. When we understand it this way, it would kind of calm down and bring it down to earth. You know? So we mystify it so just gracefully. And at the moment, why do we have fear about it all? You know? These are minds, thoughts. So we put into our minds these thoughts. And the second two, the second two lines are expressing the bodhicitta motivation. As we talk and we discuss creating karma, the fundamental, the, the main factor that determines the character of the action you do, which means the result that will come. The main factor that determines the quality of the seed you plant, which produces the fruit. It's not the action, it's the motivation. So here we're expressing our body human motivation. It's a reason, putting it, it's like we, we'd say, it, it's a reason for doing this action, sitting here, listening to this reason. Our reason is, our goal is, our purpose, our motivation is there. The reason we want to become a Buddha is the long term, so we can be a benefit sentient being. Long term benefit. The Kalina says, always aspire to do what is most beneficial. If you can, long term, better than short term. And that's, of course, the way to go, but it's the same. Long term. The second prayer, seven limbs. Is this this? I mean, maybe I should be talking about it. Ah, uh, yeah, we will. We'll have it later. We'll get further down the path. The end of the book, if you don't get to Tantra, we'll discuss it there. Um, okay, so this is just seven different actions. The first one is prostrating. It's like a very kind of elaborate handshake. It's like a greeting, a respectful greeting. The prostrate people do it. Prostrate, it's like bowing the head, shaking hands greeting the person politely. The second one is uh, making offerings. It's really necessary and auspicious and appropriate. When you go to a house, you don't go empty-handed, do you? You, take, you bring something with you. Offer. Offer's amazing. And of course, whatever you just do, it's just in the mind that that's a bit correct karma. The third one is we acknowledge our negativity. That's, that's what we regret it. The, the, the next one is acknowledging our virtue. We never do this. That's an incredibly important quality. So-called rejoicing. The next two are really crucial in terms of, in, in order to keep a strong connection with the Buddhas, with the Lamas, the teachings, this life, next life. We need to ask, we need to want it, aspire for it, request it. So we request the holy things today. When we request them, the teachings, this is the main cause of getting it. In the same sense that if you really want to buy something, the main cause you asking for it, it won't, it won't come to you. Your computer won't come to you. You've got to go say, may I have that computer? That's called asking. It's all a fancy word for it is request. That's all. And the last one is to dedicate all the merit in this. And this is, this is many of these pujas and things we'll talk about later. But they do. All it is is just a series of these verses and after verse after verse of these steps. We'll discuss that. And then the third little prayer is to offer a mandala, and all that means is to think creatively of all the, if you don't know Buddhist cosmology, think of all the contents of this universe that, that make people happy, all the nice objects of the senses. We offer them, 
pile them up, and then you can think of it in your head, like we did before breakfast. And then, you, as much as you can, think the offer, amazing offering to the Buddha. Because he will hear himself, and you can think of it as a request for the future. Sange chadang so ke chognam la jang so badu dagni kyab suchi jagi jin so gipe sonam ki drola penche sange dropa so sange chadang so ke chognam la jang so badu dagni kyab suchi jagi jin so gipe sonam ki drola penche sange dropa so Sange chadang so ke chognam la chan cho baru dagni kyab suchi dagi jin so gipe sonam ki drola penche sange dropa sho go som gu pe go ne chak se lo nya sham yi chol cha chin malu bol Sog me ne sag dig tum tam che shag Ge pa ge wa nam la che iran Kor wa ma tom bar du leg jug ne Dro la che ki ko lo kor wa dan Dag jen ge nam jang chub chen po nyo Saji pe ki jog shing me tog Chami rab ling ji ni de gen pa di Sang ge jing du mi te ur wa gi Dro kon nam jag jing la cha pa sho And then remembering, as we said before, remain in, in Tantra the very essence of the meaning of the word offering, when we say so, the word puja, offering, sure, and together, is to visualize the recipients, here the Buddha, delighting in the offering, receiving it. So imagine this. Hidam guru ratna mandala kam niryatayami Okay. So what we've been doing is going through these days, this last couple of days, taking all the points we've been discussing and presenting them in this orderly way according to this course to Buddhahood. A teacher starts us to prime our minds with this little meditation he cobbled together, like these 18 bullet points, to think about the advantages that we do have and the disadvantages that we haven't got. Like we're not born in a war zone, we're not, not born an animal, that's a good start. We're not born crazy yet, not totally. You know, we've got all our limbs in the right place, a little bit, and all the brain cells working nicely. So, you know, all, we're free of all the terrible things, and we've got actually got good advantages. You know, sanity and clarity and a reasonable health and time and space and leisure more than anything, but we've got enough generosity karma there that we can actually have time to do things like this because we've got the dollars to give, you know. The time, even. Forget the dollars. Just the time. Most people's lives are just this drudge. Just hour after hour after day. Exhausting. No time, no space for anything. So it's miraculous that we can lift our head above it and access these, and especially, of course, the most ama amazing advantage that we can access these, these thoughts, these virtuous thoughts, you know, just because we've practiced them in the past. That's how come they pop up in our mind and we pay attention to them. Unbelievable. So precious. And we don't want to waste this precious resource. Don't just sit on our laurels. All this is the product of hard work. So when we think of it this way, you don't want to waste it because you know you see, you remember the hard, you don't remember, but we can imagine the hard work we must have done to produce these results. So I must not waste it. That leads us to the next point for our teacher. Into, into junior school, grade one. Now we start taking Buddha's teachings. It's all Buddha's teachings, but our teacher kind of cobbled that together. This is now taken from all the different texts, all Buddha's teachings. First one, impermanence. But not subtle impermanence, which is very fascinating. Gross impermanence. Not just impermanence of cups and toilets, but of me. Gets us right between the eyeballs. And he was really, his, his agenda is a wake up call. This increases our wish not to waste this life because I realize I will die. Lord knows when. Oh my God, what can I do? Galvanize into action. 
So who we got to, then we think about to increase our wish, not to waste this life. We then think about the suffering of the likely possibilities of types of rebirth, which is taken from all the Buddha's extensive explanations of the different beings in the universe. You know. If it's increased wake up call, no way do I want to be born as a rat or a dog or a, you know, not to mention the other ones we can't even see. I have to think about all this. Really think about this. It seems so abstract. Because we, why? Because we so desperately cling this to our self-existent permanent me with being a human, female, fat, Australian, this, that, whatever it might be. We're stuck with that picture. We're obsessed with being that acorn. Polish ourselves every day, change our hats, hate ourselves because we're a fat acorn, try to be a nice acorn, cover up the wrinkled acorn, desperate to stay a nice acorn, like a joke, tunnel vision. Ridiculous. Now I've raved on so much I forget what I was talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Perfect human rebirth, death and impermanence, lower realms. So, you know, think about how and, and this is okay, I want okay, so okay, I'll keep going. I won't go off. Okay, I'll keep going. So then who can I turn to? Where's the doctor? Please, I'm desperate. I don't want to like dip, you know. It's like, you know, when you start seeing all those movies about the cancerous the holes and the lungs. Oh my god. I don't want that. Where's the doctor to give me the methods to know how to stop to not get cancer? That's all it needs. Healthy fear. Healthy, reasonable fear. Wake up call. Because we need fear because we're as thick as posts, you know, stuck in our self-existence, stuck in our permanence, stuck in our narrow mind. We've got to use kind of rough methods to wake us up. And this is what will lead us. So now we get to turn to the Buddha. The doctor, check out when he's a decent doctor, and want his methods because we're sick of suffering. The Dharma, the Sangha, like we talked. Now we begin to practice. Now we finally begin to practice. Each of these steps is priming us to begin to practice. Now you put your money where your mouth is and you abide by the medicine. You take the medicine, you apply the remedies, is what it says, which is the, the remedy of, of, of karma, abiding by karma. Of course, it's a massive learning for us, but it's a brand new concept. But fundamentally, everything we think and do and say is the main cause of what my mind experiences. I'm, I'm the boss. I'm the creator. I made me. What I do and think and say is the main cause. It's not a complicated concept. So get our head around it, that's all. So we abide by the laws of karma. We don't have, and basically the simplest level of it is, is this passive, seemingly passive, refraining from harming. Good enough. Good enough. You live your life refraining from harming, minding your own business, backing off, leaving sentient beings alone. Get out of their heads. Don't kill them. Don't lie to them. Don't steal from them. Don't cheat on them. Don't say rude words to them. Don't talk about them behind their backs. Don't rabbit onto them about nothing. And don't use harsh words. And don't lie to them. And then control your mind, the beginning to control your mind, the grossest level of three main delusions. Give up the really extra gross craving. Give up the really extra gross level of anger, which is ill will. And give up the really gross level of ignorance, you know, narrow-minded fundamentalism. If you just live according to those simple ten, checklist of ten, it is not complicated. We make it complicated. We make spiritual practice complicated. Thirty years later, you're still practicing. I don't know what practice is. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't understand any of this. We're still living in fear and panic still. Like we are ridiculous. It's not complicated. Ten things we ask you to do. That's it. We just want to be, you know, play safe. Just don't do those ten things. I swear to you, it's Findarius. When you discover how simple it is. It's just tough to do it, but it's not complicated. Ten things, ten things. Some of your body, some of your speech, some of your mind. If you just did this, you can die with a happy mind. You, you guarantee you set and sow the seeds to get another decent birth. And keep on bopping. But you can do more, like we're talking, go to high school and get to the root of the problem. The delusions that, 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 that inform our actions. They're the root cause. Then we start to go into those. Learn to meditate get some concentration, learn Buddhist psychology, which is crucial, and then start to do the toughest job of all, which is the real job of being a Buddhist. Now we really become a Buddhist. Morality is not unique to the Buddha. But his model of the mind, pretty, pretty incredible, in my opinion, obviously. But pretty, if you look into it, and quite unique. You've really not got to gloss over it. Just, you know, we all know words like love and compassion. Oh, yeah, yeah, ego. Oh, yeah, yeah. But he's got his own precise definitions of these things. 
and it's fundamentally radically different from the usual way you think about the mind. So we've got to unpack it and look at it so carefully. And if you don't know what, you know, because the point he's making here, as we know, this is what outrageous point is, is that these negative states of mind, this, this, this technical term used to refer to the one of the three categories of, t- of states of mind in our mental consciousness, positive, negative, neutral, there's no fourth category. All our states of mind, all our emotions, all of our psychosis, all of our insanity, all of our, all of our, um, all of our, you know, tendencies all come under these three headings. It's either positive, negative, or neutral. And they're technical terms. And, the, and as we've been talking, the negative ones have these two main characteristics of being deeply suffering and of being liars, cause, because they come down to being misconceptions. And they're trained in the mind, they're programmed in our mind from countless lives, that's why they're so instinctive. You do anything often enough, it becomes a habit, doesn't it? You do anything often enough, you be, it becomes a habit. That's what instinct is, it's just habit. So how come instinctive anger, instinctive jealousy, instinctive fear, but we practice something else, to perfection. And all we're trying to do is practice virtue until that is instinctive. That's all we're trying to do. But the first step is to unravel and unpack the mind and get to see clearly and vividly these, these neuroses and, and, and remove them from the mind because that's the Buddha's point. They're adventitious. They do not belong. They're unnecessarily, they're unnecessary embellishments. They're not necessary to be a being, a person. Whereas our view in the world says utterly you'd be abnormal if you didn't have anger. You'd be abnormal if you didn't have jealousy. That's how, how insane our models are. Easy to, it's easy to, it's, we can be forgiven for thinking this. So we've got to look really carefully for what Buddha is saying. We'll just swallow it whole. It does, it's not easy to see how anger can be removed from the mind. It sounds insane. We can't even imagine a person like this. They, we, think in, they, we think they're insane. So we've got to think of it so carefully. Understand it by looking, first understanding the, the definitions of these states of mind and what Buddha says about them. <coughs> And there's extensive teachings and commentaries over the centuries, texts that are written about it. Are quite subtle how the mind works. In fact, it's a little bit more difficult. You've got to keep going into the body subtle part. You know, our head, like I say, our head is full of roommates. Countless thousands of thoughts. Thousands. All the time. Never stopping. In fact, so many, they're just like, it's like this, what's that machine they, they call? You put it on, it's called white noise. It seems to me like the most dreadful thing that you know, it just proves whatever you project onto it makes you happy, isn't it? Actually, when I was thing in, in Stradbroke, Stradbroke Island, I'd do it like a month editing of the year, someone kindly offered me her house in Stradbroke Island, just off the coast from Brisbane. Gorgeous, overlooking the ocean. You know, my ideal of a nice place, the ocean. And a bit distant from the ocean, but you can hear it. And then you, you listen to it, and you think, oh, so wonderful, the ocean. You know? But actually, if you hear it, and then you think of a, you think of a freeway, exactly the same sound. It really is. It's hilarious. So it just proves, you know, what, how our minds project on the thing. Anyway, it was a thought. This white noise machine thing they talk about. Well, our mind's like that. Or it's like the roar, I always think of it, it's like the roar of a football crowd in the distance. Like you live a half a case on the, the MCG or five case, who knows how big the noise is if you're 100,000 people at the grand final and the Swannies win. The Swannies are going to lose this year, I think. Um, it's just this noise, isn't it? Big noise. But you know intellectually it's 100,000 people all shouting at once. But you can't hear any one of those voices, can you? Because it's all merged together. But if one voice is louder than all the others, that's the one you can hear. Well, that's like our mind. The ones that come to the surface are loud most, and that's when they're really screaming, like the depression voice and the anger voice and the jealousy voice. They're the ones we can hear. But they've been going on for so long, and the rest of them are just this noise in the distance. Because, we, because our mind is never stopping. Never stopping because of the habit of countless eons of junk. So aren't we lucky that we're not like some poor human beings who are born as a human but have these all these insane, paranoid, delusional, insane thoughts the whole time. No one taught them. It's old junk from the past. Aren't, I mean, we've got all that junk in our mind, but it hasn't ripened. Aren't we lucky? But it's all down there. It's all in there, you know. So this is what we have to do. We have to unpack and go into this mind. Unconscious. Buddha's view of unconscious leaves you all for dead, I tell you. And this, so the thing is, the thing to see, the key to success in understanding how we can rid the, 
how we can become enlightened, how we can achieve nirvana, which is the ceasing of these delusions, the ridding of them from your mind. The key to understanding that is to understand how they're all concepts. Thoughts, 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 ideas, assessments, opinions, viewpoints. This is the key to success, to get this. So there's a cup. We can hear that's a viewpoint, a thought. But screaming in terror with your eyes wide open in paranoia, I hate you, I want to kill you. We don't think of that as a thought. We think of that as a feeling, a desperate emotion. But it's obvious it's thought. If I'm screaming and having an angry fit, and you know, you, t you, you put your MP3, you put your recorder on, and you record me and then transcribe me. And then a, a person who's a bit passive aggressive doesn't shout and yell, but has lots of crazy negative thoughts. And there are people like this. Remember that guy recently, the one who killed all those kids? People just said he was weird. He didn't go around screaming and yelling. But we can deduce by that action of murdering all those people that he had extremely angry thoughts. Don't put fancy terms on it. It's called violent rage and hate. So you wrote down his thoughts and he cared to write them down for you and you shared those two pieces of paper, the person who's screaming and shouting, looking so angry, probably has mild angry thoughts if you read the words they're saying, if you compare with that guy, he just looked weird. So thought, obviously anger comes down to the thought. Obviously. And this is the point, so simple. All the stuff that comes out the mouth, whether it's screaming and shouting and yelling or whatever, is thoughts, including love and compassion. It's thoughts. And we can see this, then we can kind of do the analysis with the microscope of our mind of all those thoughts. And we can start to unpack them. And we can, and this is the point. This is the point. All these roommates in there, all shouting and yelling together. But maybe, isn't it, the ones that come out and the ones that, you know, are all the bad ones, the neurotic ones, the, all the ones that are neurotic eye-based, the hurt, the, the pain, the depressed, the jealous thoughts. They're the roommates that are all making a song and dance. And the poor little virtuous thoughts, like the kindness and loveless and, and love and compassion, they're all hiding under the bed and in the cupboards because they're scared to come out. I think of it like that. And so we can't hear those. They're scaredy babies. You know, because all the other guys run the show. So that's why we think we're so horrible. Because all we hear is the negative thoughts. So we have to start listening to these thoughts and, and being analytical. That's the point. We have to be analytical about them. That's what being your own therapist means. When you have this basis of Buddhist psychology which describes the character of, the, of this mind of ours in his particular view, then we use that, of course, as our way to analyse when we hear the thoughts. So when you've been your own therapist, you've got to be quite tricky to hear all the thoughts, to hear them clearly, what they're saying. And then you have to start seeing how they're lies. Or it might have punched me in the nose. He might have looked, come home late from work. He did come home late from work, in fact. But because I've got a strong tendency to fear and jealousy, then you can imagine my thoughts, right? All the stories about what I'm saying. If I wrote it all down, I'd have a novel written before he gets home late. Wouldn't I? Wouldn't I? And if I'm really trying to be my own therapist, I'd hear them all as I'm sitting at the kitchen, you know, or you know, I'm a good wife and he's the husband earning the money. Let's just say, you know? But you know how your mind runs rampant. And you imagine all the things he's doing, and you've heard about that secretary, and you're free. I mean, all these cl cliched stories. You're going crazy in your mind. And the point is, you don't think you're making it up. You think it's real. And then when he comes in, you slam him with all these things. You did this, and you said that, and you this, and you this. And he says, hey, Rabina, I didn't. Yes, you did. You should be relieved. You should say, oh, you didn't do it? Oh, what a relief. <laughs> Who says that? We don't. Because our thoughts have gone mad. And, I, and this is the point. Bad enough, as Lama Zoka says, that I'm seeing him. There's some truth there. There's some element of truth. It's not complete paranoia. He does come home late. He maybe does look at the secretary. But he really does love me, you know. This is safe. But bad enough that I see him wrongly. But the worst thing is I believe that I'm right. I believe that what I see is true. Because my thought, this is the shocking part. My thoughts, the character of my thoughts, my jealousy in this case, actually completely fill my... It's like I pick up my jealousy glasses and I put them on and now he, can peer, he appears a certain way. And I don't realise I put my jealousy glasses on. I don't realise I'm not seeing him as he really is. This is the way the delusions work. So whether it's angry, 
angry, you know, your angry, your angry glasses, your attachment glasses, your jealous glasses, your depressed glasses, whatever it might be. We can see this, that what's out there takes on, as they put it in Buddhist psychology, what's out there, the way it appears to us, it's a very good way they talk, it takes on the aspect, means it looks like, it takes on the aspect of whatever's in your mind. So you've got angry glasses on, we know how the world looks when you've got angry glasses on. When you've got your depressed glasses on, we know how the world looks then. Hideous, grey, nothingness. We know how the, how the world looks when you're full of attachment and excitement and you're in love with the body. Everything shines, it's crystal clear and sharp, even ugly people look nice. Because attachment glasses make things look nice, which is why we love it. It triggers nice feelings in the body. But these are all liars. There's some truth there. There is a chocolate cake on that plate. There is some truth there. He did come home late. But then we embellish it. We, em we, we embellish it. That's what delusions do. They take something that does exist, like a cake, like a husband who's late, and then we embellish it. And then we believe our story is the objective truth. And that's why if you're a very angry person and then someone in the shop just kind of looks wrong at you, you probably want to sue them for abuse. And because, and this is the, the thing that is so shocking that we really have to have the intelligence to distinguish between, is what a person from their side actually did and how we perceive it, what they did. So because I have a lot of pain and hurt and a lot of anger, the extent, this is the point, the extent of my anger, I blame you for it. I believe that's how bad your action was. This is the part that really, we've got to be so careful. It's terrifying. So if I'm really I'm outrageously over the top jealous, sadly, pathetically, suffering terribly, then he will look like a monster to me. And of course, it'll be unsustainable for him. He, can't, he won't be able to cope with this nonsense. It'll be unbearable for him. And then, of course, I blame him. I blame him for my jealousy. This is the part that's so shocking. And this is where it gets tricky. Because people do harm us. People do cheat on us. There is some, there is truth, but it's very hard to distinguish the actual, the actual, what the person actually did from their side, in their mind, and what they really did, and what they were thinking they were doing, and then what I think they did. There's, there's rarely any connection between those two, but that's what we have to discover. And that's why you try to do mediation between two people. It's practically impossible. Because each person is full of the hurt of what they feel that he did. And the conviction, because I feel this, you must have done that. And this is the killer. This is where we have to have such clarity. And it's very hard to get clarity amongst all these painful, you know, emotions. But talk about being your own therapist. It really demands incredible clarity. And you can only start with the clarity of your mind, seeing how your mind is exaggerating and distorting. Then I can begin to look at what you actually do. It's impossible to start just looking at what you actually do if I can't even work out my own thoughts. And then this is the point, like my friends in prison, like that woman I mentioned on death row. So if we want to quantify how bad it was what they were doing to her, it was, it's on the heavy duty bad scale. Because she could change her mind, it wasn't such suffering. This is the part that we don't like to hear in the West because we think we're, it's, you know, that, that's like getting, letting them get away with it. The part we don't realize in the Samsaric world is that I have the power to change my interpretation of your bad action. And that's the point. That's practice. That's practice. That's practice. It doesn't mean they're right. Those torturers, those young Tibetan nuns, Terrible what they did. You can't deny it. Shocking. Torture and sexual abuse for a couple of years. But they have the power to change their mind. Meaning, literally, change their interpretation of that action. And that's practice. It needs courage to do it because it feels like it's letting a person get away with something. It feels like you're saying they didn't do it after all. Cool. Actually, one couple of interesting stories about, you know, what people do and how you can change your mind. Or forgive, as we'd say in the West. That's another discussion. But at one of this conference we did in San Francisco called Happiness and Its Causes, like the ones that Tony Steele does in Sydney. We did one in San Francisco in 2008. And, we, and one of the things was a piece about um, one people talking was about what he called restorative justice. And one woman who's a lawyer, 
she was talking about what she's doing in Oakland with all young black kids. And then there's a friend of mine who's perhaps to be black, who, from North Carolina, who worked with us in prisons, um, Andre. And Andre's son got murdered, stabbed in the bar. Mm -hmm. And that evening, the local news interviewed for the news, how did you feel about the, the, the murderer? He was in tears of compassion for the murderer of his own boy. He said, how, he said his suffering is just beginning. How can I not have compassion for him? His suffering is just beginning. And they, you know, because he works with young black men as a mentor. How, we must take care of our young men. We must, you know, it was incredible. His own boy, you know, he was able to have compassion. And the other one was a woman, and they had a meeting on the on stage. It was a woman, a white woman, from Christian, from Texas, and whose daughter was murdered, raped and murdered by two young guys, and they happened to be white. So the thing was, for years and years, she was working through her own stuff of it, became a Christian, all these things, and, became, wanted, and wanted to meet. So she went through the restorative justice business and met one of these young men who's you know, life or death, or I can't remember now, don't know. And he was so happy, he said, for years, this is what he'd been dying for, to try and you know, find a way, because he'd come to terms with it, wanted to do some people and all that. So this young man, he's a young guy on crazy drugs, paranoid, ice or something, out of his brain with paranoia, raped this girl, and then they figured they had to kill her, she'd tell. So they executed her, made her kneel down, shot her in the head. And he told the mother, she was 16, I think, he told the mother, because she wanted to know how it was at the time of the death, you know, he said that she looked me in the eye before I shot her and said, I forgive you, and God does too. Some people are pretty incredible, aren't they? You've got to admit. So all those things for me, which are nice stories, show proves a point. That you can change your mind. That's all they prove to me, that you can change your mind. You can change your mind. And the point is this, like I said before, forget even about if you have the real karma. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Just to have this incredible, grown up, mature, self confident ability to see clearly how your anger and your jealousy and your depression and your fear and your rage and your hurt are what cause you suffering. This is the simple point of what he's making. It's not complicated, but it's so massive. And why it's so hard is because when we listen to the character of delusions, they're all dualistic. They're all raging. They're all ego-based. And as Lama Yeti puts it, and it's very cruel sounding, they're the self-pity me. They're all the voices of the self-pity me. So even with courage, if we start listening to the voices, these roommates, listen to the story, not just feel the feeling. We've got to listen to the words that depression is saying, but we can't. We're overwhelmed by the feeling and the panic of it, we hate it. We've got to listen to the words that depression is saying. We've got to listen to the words of jealousy, anger, this is what we really become our own therapist. Because they're all thoughts. But they're, they're over, we're overwhelmed by the feeling we can't hear the thoughts. This is the skill. And then when we hear those thoughts, and we're really analytical, really skillful and brave, we're going to hear it's just rampant, panic-stricken, poor me. It sounds cruel, but you listen and you listen. It doesn't mean it's not suffering. This is the point. You see, when, when we say someone's suffering, and then we say have compassion, we, we have an instinctive assumption that they're innocent victims of some un, unkind action of someone else. So as soon as we hear that depression and anger and jealousy are self-pity, and we can change them because they're the cause of our own suffering, it feels like blame, because that's our dualistic model now. That's the assumption we have. Dualistic, I'm innocent. As long as you're innocent, we can be prepared to have compassion for somebody. In other words, let's say you harm me and, I go, and I, you really harm me and I get really angry. Then we think that anger is good. But if you didn't harm me, I, I just got angry with you. Then that anger is bad. It's so irrational. Anger is anger. But we, we justify it in some sense. We think it's right. Like I said, that guy, the old Catholic guy who visited my friends on death row in Kentucky, 
he realized after 30 years that his rage was, was, was why he suffered, that he had space in his life. 